So, welcome to lecture number 13, which is uh, the first lecture of capsule number 7 after <coughs> the mid sim. Today, we are looking at three components of a flight gliding, climbing, and ceiling. Okay. So, again, this presentation has been prepared by uh, this student called Udit Vohra. We are already familiar with him because if you recall, he was the one who made the presentation on the atmosphere also. This is the second presentation that he prepared for me uh, while he was here as an intern during this summer. Okay. So, the layout is very straightforward. We are going to look at some birds. We are going to look at how they glide, then how they climb and what are the limits to their altitude of employment or the operative ceilings. That is all the three things today. Okay. So, let us see the gliding flight. This is how aircraft glide. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay. So, what exactly is gliding flight? Not hitting somebody with a thermocol plane, that is not a gliding flight. Gliding flight is basically the art of silent flight or flight without any thrust. In the history of aviation, I have spoken a lot about Otto Lilienthal and so many other people. They were the ones who perfected the aerodynamics of flight by learning how to glide. And it is only later on that sustained flights were possible because of the provision of power plant on the aircraft. But if you really want to enjoy flight and if you want to test your skill or airmanship as we say, then gliding flight is the most challenging and exciting thing. Okay. So, even though glide is a very silent flight, still we have forces acting on the aircraft in the glide and this is a dramatical representation. So, we do not glide like this. Okay. This is a very large angle, but just to increase the visibility, we have an aircraft which is operating at an angle with the horizontal. It is uh, mass acts downwards towards the center of the earth and from the flight path perpendicular would be the lift force. The drag force would be along the flight path opposing the flight and the angle between the path at which it operates or glides in this case with the horizontal is the flight path angle or in this case the sink angle or the gliding angle theta. Not sink angle that is the wrong thing, it is a gliding angle theta. Okay. So, if you resolve the forces on an aircraft during glide, we can see that there is uh, the lift component will be w sin cos, cos theta and the drag w sin theta t will be 0. So, straight away we get tan of theta would be 1 by L by d. Okay. I have not said d by L because we are interested in L by d as a parameter. You could always say tan theta is equal to d by L where theta is the gliding angle. So, obviously, if you want to have a low tan theta, which means if you want to have a lower glide path angle, you would like to have higher L by D. So, L by D is directly controlling the angle during the glide. So, hence aircraft with higher L by D will be in general gliding at a lower angle theta compared to aircraft with the lower L by D. Okay. So, when you glide, you actually cover some horizontal distance in glide from the point where you start to the point where you hit the ground. The horizontal distance on the ground is called as the range in a glide and the range is going to increase when either the theta reduces or when the L by D max increases. In other words, if you are gliding at a condition such that L by D is L by D max, you will get the least angle of theta and longest range during glide. Okay. So, that is uh, now how do you know at what angle I should fly, at what angle of attack I should fly, so that L by D is L by D max. For a pilot it is very difficult to know. So, the pilot determines this only by speed and also by flight experience or flying experience. Another important point is after your glide starts, how much time can you stay in the air? That is called as the sink rate or the 
rate at which you lose the altitude dh by dt sink rate. So, it is very obvious that if your sink rate is low you may travel distance less or more we do not care, but you will be in the air for maximum time after your glide starts. So, it is not necessary that the distance travelled will be the largest when you are operating at the minimum sink rate. The distance travelled is a function of only L by D and the angle glide angle theta, but the sink rate during glide is a function of dh by dt. So, we will see we will derive the expression. So, from the previous uh, figure you know where we had L equal to half rho V square S C L okay, and W cos theta not equal to W, but W cos theta it is equal to W when you have theta equal to 0 or when you are in level flight. And we also know that tan theta is equal to 1 by L by D. So, that means sin theta upon cos theta is equal to 1 by L by D. So, cos theta will be uh, you can replace it. Now, dh by dt as you can see from the previous figure is actually the sink rate V sin theta. So, I take sin theta as cos theta into 1 by L by D put it inside. Now, you can push this cos theta inside it will become cos square theta uh, cos cube theta rather hmm. and there is L and D. So, L contains C L you can replace L by D by C L by C D. So, you will get C L cube also inside, but suppose for example, a situation where theta is very small which is normally the case in the case of gliding. Okay. So, now we want to find the condition at which what should be the C L and hence what should be the V because V and C L are connected to each other what should be the C L at which I get the maximum sink rate and I am assuming that cos theta is almost equal to 1. So, therefore, this expression will now become minus root of 2 w C L rho s into C D by C L outside. So, C D square comes in C D square and C L square. So, there will be a cube there. Okay. So, here dh by dt will become minus 2 w by rho s c d by c l power 3 by 2. This is a familiar ratio. We had this ratio also for the minimum power required in flight. Okay. So, hence it is interesting that you can get the condition at which the sink rate will be minimum. So, the range in the glide is maximum when you fly at c l by c d maximum. The endurance or the sink endurance is maximum or the sink rate is minimum when you fly at a condition at which C D L C L 3 by 2 by C D is maximum because that maximum will give you the lowest d h by d t. So, the conditions are not the same as I mentioned a few minutes ago okay. and you can derive this expression by going further into it you can get this expression. So, the L by d for maximum endurance will be approximately 0.866 times L by D max. Okay. So, you do not fly at max L by D, but you fly at around 86 percent of the max of L by D. Okay. Now, just to get some idea about sink rate and how it changes, I have taken one of the most successful gliders in the world called as the Schweizer SGS 126. It is a old version, there is a new version called as 1-36. This aircraft went out of production many years ago. There is a better version available, but this is one of the world's most famous and popular gliders. So, let us see how does the sink rate of this glider change for various uh, conditions. So, the same glider I have shown under four conditions or what are these conditions? Basically, these conditions are the speeds at which you fly. Remember for the pilot there is nothing like what is C L by C D maximum, what is C L 3 by 2 by C D maximum. These ratios are only for us those who do analysis or performance calculations or those who do design. For the pilot everything is speed. So, the pilot relates speed to L by D. So, the pilot is told that if you want to glide maximum distance glide at this particular speed. If you want to be in the air for maximum time glide at this particular speed, then your sink rate will be the minimum. So, you can see the sink rate can be 
between 1.8 knots to 3.2 knots. Now, knots is a standard speed unit for aviation. Those of you who do not understand knots or do not appreciate knots, just multiply it by almost 1.853 or let us say by 2 to get kilometers per hour. So, you will get an idea about or oh, sorry meter per second. Okay. So, it will give you an idea just multiply by almost 2 to get in meter per second that is what probably you are more familiar with. So, the air speed you can see the 4 colors shown there also correspond to how much distance is covered in the glide. So, when the aircraft is uh, gliding it can cover around 6000 feet. All of them began from the same altitude, but they hit the ground at different uh, distances depending on the speed at which they are traveling. Okay. Right. So, while we are at this particular point I wanted to just share some excitement with you about uh, gliding and soaring. So, can someone tell me the difference between these two terms as far as the aviation is concerned? What is meant by gliding and what is meant by soaring? What do you think? Anyone? The mics are all around here. So, I will give you an example the birds are soaring and the aircraft are gliding in general. Okay. Aircraft normally do not soar, they only glide, but birds are the ones that are champions in soaring. So, now do you get yes, what is your what is your view? Yes. So, my name is Atherba. I think soaring means using only an air to push uh, and pass through uh, streams of fast moving air to go up. That means do not use it. I think that is correct. Yeah. Okay. That is that's very much close and it is correct actually. Essentially, uh, anybody wants to add to this? soaring and gliding. So, pretty much pretty much true what he said, but one can elaborate it a little bit more. So, in gliding you are only sinking down continuously. You can minimize the sink rate or you can maximize the range, okay. but you are always coming down. It is a continuous downward spiral. But soaring is something where you can even go up or you can maintain the altitude for a very long time. So, that you cannot do unless you have a power plant, but power plants cannot be there in gliders. So, then we use ambient wind. So, if you are able to maintain your altitude in air in a power off situation for a very long time, mainly using the thermals as you said or upward drafts of air, then you are soaring. Okay. But you should do this without any power, neither flapping. So, birds when they soar, the eagles which they soar, they do not flap their wings, they are not using the propulsive power to keep up, they are basically looking at the currents. So, sometimes they glide and then they soar and then they glide and then they soar. Okay. So, we try to emulate them in the gliders. But we also have a category of aircraft called as sail planes. We have gliders and we have sail planes. So, what do you think is the difference between a glider and a sail plane? What is a glider and what is a sail plane? A sail plane is a very advanced glider. A very efficient glider is called as a sail plane because sail planes are designed essentially for soaring and gliders are designed basically for gliding. Okay. But each can do the other thing also subject to the flying skills. Now, since there is no power plant available or since there is no means of thrust, then there are three ways of launching or three ways of operating a glider or a sail plane. The first way is called as winch launch. This is the most common one 
and let us have a look at what is meant by winch launch. Hey, this is Bruno. I'm excited to share with you what we've been working on over Volume the last be year. We've spent literally hundreds of man hours refurbishing this old glider winch, and now we're winching out of Nephi, Utah. So these guys have made and, a new uh, winch. If you're from Europe or yeah, the UK, you're probably about like, their winch. Yeah, no big deal. You they see this all the time. Winch, and they are going if you're to from the US, now. check this out. Now, this is going to blow you your mind. Some of you who are not very much, you will see very beautiful view, views here, and some people. All out! All out! All out! Now that's good. Now we can, now I can pull up. So do you think the cable is still attached? Or is it released? That's a sleeper. Still attached. You cannot see it right now. It's in the door. still attached because the winch is at the end of the runway I wasn't exaggerating when I said how stinking amazing this is here the glider is climbing faster than an airliner taking off uh, we have about 8,000 feet of rope on the drum right now. We can do as much as 11,000 feet. And with that, we can get many thousands of feet in the air above the airport with just a single launch. At this point of the launch, we're now getting towards the top, and so the glider starts to roll forward to get ready to release the rope. So now the glider and, is almost uh, vertical. You can see, you can actually hear it. it almost. It off. As soon as so here's the release right here. Break, we would be full forward. That was a back release. There it goes. And, we got and now we're free. So we just point, push the nose down so that way we can maintain airspeed. And I'm going to raise the main gear, which you can see underneath us. Landing there it goes right there. Inside. And now we're free to soar with the birds and fly for many hours. We're thousands of feet above the airport. We have plenty of altitude to go find a thermal and enjoy the day. Hey, thanks for joining us and uh, hope you enjoyed this video. So now, just a simple question. There is a winch which is pulling the aircraft. When the winch, when the rope becomes almost vertical, the rope is released and now the glider is free to fly. How much time do you think it can keep flying? There is no power plant. What do you think? So, is there a limit to how long can you stay in the air? What is that limit? Come on, you can guess. So, let me ask you a separate manner. What is required so that you do not come down? Upward draft of air. Okay. Is there a limit to how much upward draft of air is available in nature? There is no limit. It all depends upon weather conditions, location and where you are. So, what do you think is the world record for maximum glide after a launch? How many hours do you think it has been possible for a person to stay in the air after launching? Take a guess. So, is it like 2 hours or is it 4 hours? Eight hours. Can you stay for eight hours? Yes, you can. There is no limit. It could be actually even twenty hours. It all depends on where you are flying, what is the condition. If you keep getting thermals, you can keep up in the air. 
So the question for you on Moodle is what is the world record for soaring after a launch? Okay. Let us see how many hours people have been able to stay up in the air after a single launch. Right. Yeah, yeah. Winch is not shown. Winch is basically a drum. Winch is a drum on which you wind a rope or a cable and then that at the end of the runway you put that and using an electrical motor you wind it at high speed. So it pulls the aircraft. As it pulls the aircraft, the aircraft gains altitude. So the cable is still connected and then when it reaches some height you release it. There is a hook in the aircraft, the pilot releases it. So the rope falls and the aircraft is already up. So it can glide. So winch basically is a thing that pulls, a drum cable mounted on a drum that pulls the aircraft, that is a winch and that is put at the end of the runway. Okay. The other way in which you can launch a glider is called as aero tow. This is an expensive way but here is a flying school which tries to uh, sell itself by showing you how you can do. Okay, so this is called as aero tow. How would you describe soaring to your in friends? In which an aircraft pulls Schedule you a flight and find your definition. And then the rope is released. This is expensive, but it is very common uh, in areas where there are many winch failures. There are complaints that winches get stuck. So this is also one very common way of doing it. Can you think of a third way? What would be the third manner in which you can provide the force for a glider, yes. One can start from a high ground and go down. Why? So one can use MGH, the altitude, let us say there is a mountain, you go to the top, that is what we do in hang gliders, we go to the top of a mountain and then we jump down, okay. But we are going to start from the level ground here, so what can you do? Anything else can be done? Yes, catapult. catapult launch is also possible but catapult is like a winch only, it is a type of a winch, okay. But catapult normally is uh, slightly different because, but yes, I mean you can use it for launching, but I would call it like a winch type only. Any other way you can think we can do it? So we can do it by cheating, 
by putting a small engine on the glider and saying that oh this is a very small engine it just provides minimum amount of thrust when do we need it just to take off and whenever there is a problem you put the engine on otherwise engine is off and the aircraft is gliding such a launching is called as a motor gliding or a motor glider it is a small aircraft actually so here is again one of the best motor gliders available today is this one with the engine 1593 kilometers with the engine so glide ratio means l by d l by d is 36 in the glide sales video which says that you can do so many things you have so many choices so this is the engine 115 horsepower so this makes you independent of either an aero tow or the winch Okay, so these are the three ways in which you can launch a glider. Okay, now let's say you are an aircraft which has got an engine or multiple engines, and it fails. If you have two engines, both of them fail. If you have one engine, that engine fails. Okay, so what you expect is there is going to be a crash, is going to come down, but that doesn't happen. Okay. so let's see what else can happen an aircraft can also glide because an aircraft without engines is a glider so this happened in a very famous incident this is a very interesting video uh, and also when you come to the end you will know the reason why it happened and i'm sure you'll have a big laugh okay so this happened to a flight brand new aircraft boeing 767 purchased by air canada let's see what happened so i think this video is only a recreation we don't have the original video obviously so it's called as a jimli glider let's see we can get quickly what happens it's just a flight 143 it's a routine flight one they've flown many times before but this time No one on board knows they've only enough fuel to reach halfway. So Boeing 767 recently purchased is on a flight. Everything is fine. Captain Bob Pearson and first officer Maurice Kintel believe they have 22000 kilograms of fuel when in reality they have only 22000 pounds a miscalculation with the fuel while converting volume into weight has gone unnoticed compounded by out of service fuel gauges catastrophic failure so they think they have 22000 kilograms of fuel but actually they have 22000 pounds of fuel and a pound is basically 2.204 pounds is 1 kg so they they are carrying 2.2 times less fuel which means they are nearly half so they planned a mission they filled a fuel and they only carried half the fuel needed so obviously the of the engines is now inevitable now everybody goofed up they are about to run drunk not just the pilot the person who fills it the person who reports it everybody goofed up The left engine dies first. So the fourth engine it goes kaput. 
So one engine failure is not a big problem. Okay, many aircraft. At an altitude of 41,000 feet and only one engine, they decide to make straight for Winnipeg. Ah, so this is important. So the altitude is 41,000 feet, and one engine is not working now. It has just no fuel, so it has become it has shut down. So what they decide is they decide that they will go to Winnipeg straight. Normally, an aircraft is flown along a particular route. So that is not a straight line that follows the air routes. They will ask the ATC, give us a direct routing to Winnipeg as a safety measure so that we can reach there as quickly as possible because one engine is not working. Landing a 767 on one engine is difficult enough, but now Captain Pearson is in a deadly race against time. Barely able to accept the situation they are in and against all hope, their right engine finally dies. The second engine also gone. Winnipeg, Air Canada 143. Air Canada 143, go ahead. We've just lost both engines. Holy cow. Their brand new twin engine jet has suddenly become a glider. But this glider, unlike any other, weighs 95 tons <laughs> and has 69 souls on board. The plane is now descending 1,000 feet for every three miles it moves through the air, knowing its distance from the nearest. 1,000 feet is a loss for every three miles in the air. That is, so you can work out the sink rate now. Okay. This is a question you can do in the tutorial. It is going to sink now. So at 41,000 feet, they have started their glide and they are losing 1,000 feet for every three miles. So how much can they go? If it is continuous, 20 miles, <laughs> that is. Ah, so the airport is therefore essential. With no engine power, the aircraft has only basic instruments working and these so won't give them the information they need. Because there are no engines, there are no instruments now. Only the mechanical instruments which I taught you, estimate their position vertical sphere indicator, airspeed indicator. Okay. Uh, how far are we from the field now? You're 35. Uh, correction, make that 39 miles from Winnipeg. So 39 miles away is Winnipeg. But with an altitude of only 8,000 feet, the news from... So now they have come to 8,000 feet. From 41,000 feet, they have come to 8,000 feet. Winnipeg is 39 miles away. They were losing 1000 feet for every 3 miles, so they can go 20 miles max. Wait, wait, wait. You are ahead of times. The co-pilot is not good. But RAM is available, but what will RAM give you? Not RAM, but RAT. What will it give you? It can't give you power to fly. RAT only gives you power for lowering the landing gear, flight control systems, that was there, otherwise they would have not really worked. Because even to glide properly, you need to control the angle. So yes, they had RAT, it came down, it worked, but it gave power for landing gear removal, etc. Let us see, it comes in the end. Bob, we can last maybe another 20 miles. Right, so now the pilot calculate that we can travel, if we fly in the optimum condition, we can travel 20 miles, Winnipeg is some 30 odd miles away, 43 miles away. So we can't make it to Winnipeg. So then they ask, where, where, do, where do we go? We are not going to make Winnipeg. The only chance now is to land at Gimli. Gimli is a decommissioned air force base with no control tower, but it is only 12 miles away. Ah, so 12 miles away, there is a disused uh, air force runway called as Gimli. Now because it is disused, there is no air traffic control, there is no safety equipment, nothing. In fact, to their horror, they realize that they do not know it, but when they go there, they realize the Gimli is now becoming a drag race hub. And there were people below running cars on the runway. And there were two cyclists on the runway when they came into land. So just see the fun now. The problem now is not reaching the runway, but overshooting it. At too high, 
and are coming in too fast. So now they are beyond the range. Normally a pilot can slow down his airplane by operating flaps. But without full hydraulics, they don't have any. They perform now what is called a gravity drop. So understand the problem now. Earlier Winnipeg was far away, so you cannot reach. Now Jimli is nearby, but now you will overshoot because you are gliding and you will travel 20 miles, it is only 12 miles. So you have to now read in. Now how do you change the sink rate by control surfaces? They are not available because flaps are not working. So they will do a gravity maneuver. On the main gear. They have to rely on the weight of a landing gear itself to lock it into place. The gear's air resistance will also help to slow the plane down. Increase the drag. But the landing only gear has been lowered. notices that the nose gear is not down. He no. decides to keep the nose to gear himself. was fifty percent jammed. It's it no didn't good. Go fully down. They're still too high and too fast. I guess I'll have to slip it. Captain Pearson side now slipping. employs an old glider to pilot drag. referred to as side slipping. He banks the plane fully left while stepping hard on the right rudder pedal. This is called crossing the controls. It turns the plane slightly sideways against the direction of travel, offering greater air resistance so that is and Jim slowing Lee. the plane down. The runway is Jim Lee. However alarming this may have seemed to all on board, he knows it's their only hope of getting down in one piece. There's one more surprise for Flight 143. They have an audience. The airfield is not empty as they'd hoped, but is being used as a drag racing strip. There are people on the ground. There are cars on the ground. Hey! Look! There! So they have side slipped, gone this way and then gone this way and then gone this way. Captain Pearson has never been so focused. He holds on for dear life, waiting for that sickening crunch. As his plane skids down the runway, Captain Pearson realizes he still has work to do. He pushes hard on his differential brakes in an effort to steer the plane away from two boys straight in front of him. <laughs> they were cycling. At last, he wrestles the metal giant to a halt. Now you see with the actual, no fuel, actual footage and no actual flaps, photographs very soon. Damaged landing gear and no emergency equipment. It was only the decisive actions and the superb skill of the flight crew of Air Canada 143 that turned a potential tragedy into a triumph. Thankfully, everyone was able to walk away from Air Canada Flight 143. And many things have happened to them since then. But they can be sure that they'll never forget the day they flew the Gimli glider. Okay. So, now, interesting thing is what happened after this. So, you might think that uh, it's a very heroic act by the pilots. But both the pilots were suspended. Why were they suspended? Because they did a stupid thing of making mistake in units. Okay, they loaded fuel. They are from Canada. Okay, but the aircraft is now working. So they think it is in kilograms, but actually it is in pound. The aircraft came from USA. In US, they still work in FPS system. So the indications are all in FPS for the fuel indicator. So when it says twenty-two thousand, they think it is kilograms. Actually, it is pounds. So shouldn't they know? They are supposed to read the manuals, they are supposed to be prepared. Now, the people who fuel the aircraft, they also goofed up. So everybody goofed up and the emergency happened. So both were suspended, the licenses were cancelled and then there was an inquiry. After some time they were reinstated and then they went on 
uh, one of the pilots actually only passed away in 2015.